Good afternoon, and welcome to this panel. Uh, the energy question, I assure you all that by the end of this hour, we will have figured out how to address the energy question um, in its entirety, of course. Um, but in, in all honesty, um, we do have quite an incredible panel here with us today, and uh, we are subject matter experts in a wide, um, wide array of energy issues. Of course, not all of them, so we'll be relying on some of the members of the audience uh, when we open up to Q&A um, to address some of the other energy issues. Um, before I introduce the panel, well, I'll go ahead and introduce the panel first. Today we have with us um, Alex Trembath. Alex is a senior analyst at the Breakthrough Institute. His work focuses on renewable energy technologies, American federal energy policy, and the history of public investments in technological innovation. We also have with us uh, Lisa Marganelli. Um, Lisa is author of Oil on the Brain, Petroleum's Long, Strange Trip to Your Tank. She has written about energy, the environment, science, and policy for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Nation, Slate, Wired, and many other publications. We are also joined today by Utebe Effiong, who has been very polite to allow us to call him UT. Um, uh, UT is a research scientist at the Risk Science Center, University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, he's also the new voice fellow at the Aspen Institute and has a special interest in environmental health. Now, the energy question. Um, you know, no, no discussion on energy today is without the question of climate change. And we have been told by scientists that there are um, certain carbon budgets within which if we are to keep the world at a stable um, level, uh, we must not burn more fossil fuels. Um, and of course, if we are to understand um, Professor Allenby, who spoke earlier correctly, um, the situation can only be managed. Um, and that brings up a whole host of issues around the kinds of technologies that are required and the innovation that's required in order to meet and address this challenge, um, or at least address it um, and manage it. Um, where the issue becomes rather complicated, and where I think that the energy um, and climate debate have not come together very well is the issue of energy access. Uh, we have 1.6 billion people without access to electricity. Um, 2.6 billion people still burning um, dung and wood uh, for cooking fuel. Um, and the climate debate has uh, conveniently allowed energy access to, um, to remain um, on the sidelines. And in a, in a sense, perhaps, trap people in um, a new form of energy poverty, where a 12 watt solar panel on a thatch roof might seem like energy access, uh, but it might not necessarily be the kind of genuine energy access that's required uh, for it will certainly be a higher energy planet. Um, and there are uh, many emerging countries that are trying to meet uh, the energy access challenge and bring millions of people out of poverty. Um, and they would probably do this through a, a range of technologies, um, including fossil fuels and nuclear and um, a whole host of renewables. The question then really is, do we have um, the ability to transfer these technologies, the spaces to innovate them, and the kinds of regulatory frameworks we need in place in order to allow these technologies to thrive and spread? Um, you know, if we look at regulation, um, we've got uh, you know nuclear industry that's trying to c make a comeback in the United States, but maybe given a, a life raft uh, by emerging markets of China and India. Um, we've got the EPA regulations here in the United States that might be, uh, as some might say, uh, uh, leading a war on coal. Uh, but at the same time, U.S. coal exports are on the rise to meet other markets. Um, we also have. Uh, lack of clarity on, um, on fracking and, and the impacts and externalities around which for a technology that has really um, helped the country in, in kind of becoming energy secure in a sense. Um, and then there's a whole range of energy issues around livelihoods, um, water, and agriculture that are sure to come up um, as we uh, move forward and try to meet poverty targets, uh, reduction targets. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that as the planet warms, we are trying to access new reserves under the Arctic. Um, I was at the Arctic Circle Assembly at the end of uh, October, beginning of November, um, in Iceland uh, this last year. And uh, nearly every head of state uh, mentioned climate change. Uh, but most of the side events um, were certainly driven towards countries' investments uh, and the geopolitics of the high north. Uh, so some really interesting questions around where we are 
uh, with uh, energy within the context of a changing climate and, and how we will power billions more lives um, as we manage this new um, environment. Um, so with that, I'm going to allow the panel to um, speak uh, about, um, you know, make it open to you guys to make some comments, and then we'll just have a conversation. Alex, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you, Karthike, and thank you for the audience being here. Thank you to uh, ASU and Future Tense New America for inviting me. I'm Alex Trembath. I'm an analyst at the Breakthrough Institute, focused on energy technologies, energy policy. And uh, I think Karthike t teed off this conversation perfectly. The, the, the comments that I want to make today focus on the way that climate and energy debates have really consistently tried to pin rich countries against poor countries in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, that's, that's happened practically and diplomatically in the UNFCCC negotiating processes where rich countries tell poor countries that they need to emit less and poor countries tell rich countries, well, you guys emitted more in the past, so there's an impasse there. Um, it happens, especially in the last five, ten years in the energy debate where we see an increasing conversation about the so-called clean tech race where the, the question is, has been for rich countries, particularly the U.S., are emerging economies going to come and steal our industries? Um, th this has played out no more seriously than in, in, the, uh, in the, the solar wars, where we've seen a serious trade war develop between China and the US. And of course, it happens in our discourses as well, as Karthike alluded to. We see the climate element of the energy climate debate entering into conversations about equity and about global growth and about global modernization in not super helpful ways where we see baked into our models of future energy consumption, baked into our assumptions about future policy, assumptions that the emerging world will not consume as much energy as the rich world does today, uh, assumptions that growth will happen on a low energy trajectory. And so my overarching point being that we have seen this rich country versus poor country dynamic in play for, as Professor Allenby said, at least 22 years as climate has really entered the global policy discussion, if not longer. So the, the, the question that I would like to bring to the table is how can we bridge this rich, poor country debate? How can we actually view climate change and view energy innovation as a global responsibility, as a global public good, collaborative, if you will, instead of competitive? And the, the way that I and we and Karthike and, I and Lisa and I have done some, some work uh, writing about this, um, along with some other folks in this room, is uh, the, way, the way that I see that happening is by viewing the rapidly growing energy demand in these emerging economies as an opportunity, not, a, not as a threat. Um, not as a threat to our competitiveness, not as a threat to our global climate, not as a threat to our environment, but as an opportunity space, as, as an opportunity for cooperation and collaboration. Um, in the last several decades, there's been a renaissance in scholarship and thinking on innovation. And one of the big lessons we've seen is that innovation, technological, social, and otherwise, tends to happen where demand is growing fastest. And uh, demand for energy, in particular, has stagnated in, in rich countries in places like the United States and Europe, but it is absolutely booming in poor countries, uh, no more so than in places like China and India, the BRICS countries what you could distinguish from very poor countries as the, the really rapidly industrializing countries. And that's where we see a lot of the innovation happening uh, in zero carbon clean energy technologies as well as carbon intensive technologies. Um, and the, uh, the, the debate around this again has, has been squared by some as a clean tech race. We're seeing China innovate in nuclear and solar mm -hmm. when the US should be capturing those jobs and those industries. So how can we prevent China and India um, and Brazil from taking those jobs when the U.S. Should, should be the ones leading the way. Those are our technologies. The Department of Energy um, and the nuclear industry developed those technologies. Why are we ceding them to China and India? Uh, and f from our perspective, that is actually a missed opportunity. Um, the, it, it, would be, it would be a missed opportunity to view these emerging markets as a threat instead of as an, as an opportunity. Um, and we have to find a way for the tremendous innovation systems potential of rich countries, which you know, we obviously shouldn't shrug off, to work with the rapidly growing demand in these countries. Um, and we're seeing signs of that, I think. Um, we're seeing lots of collaboration between, for instance, the US and places like China 
in nuclear technology and in carbon capture technology. You know, there, there are projects between Sinopec in China and the Southern Company in carbon capture for coal. Um, Bill Gates's Terra Power is, is trying to deploy its new nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors in China since he, since he and they don't think that, uh, that fourth generation and next generation nuclear power has an immediate, um, immediate market to tap in the United States. Obviously, uh, solar power is a, another very good example of this, where we would not be having the, glo the global solar revolution today were it not for the manufacturing and production innovation taking place in China. Mm -hmm. um, even more exciting than the innovation taking place between, say, the US and China is the innovation taking place now between these rapidly industrializing countries. We're no longer seeing just the emerging world tied to the industrial experience of, of the West. We're starting to see the emerging world lead itself into modernization and prosperity. Um, and by this, I mean we see China and Russia investing in uh, nuclear technology and nuclear power plant construction in places like South Africa. We see South Korea building nuclear p power in uh, Middle Eastern countries. We see Latin America and the Middle East as some of the hottest markets in large solar PV construction. And we see countries as diverse as South Africa and Argentina, China, India starting to explore, explore their shale energy resources like the U.S. has explored ours. Um, so point being that the, the idea that we can view rapidly growing energy demand in these emerging economies as an opportunity is not just a, is not just a nice thought. It's not just, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a fun thought. It's actually happening. Mm -hmm. This innovation is happening. These avenues towards accelerating energy innovation are happening. And it, I think it would be a mistake to try and silo off different countries from working together. It would certainly be a mistake to continue this unproductive dichotomy between rich and poor countries that has infected the climate and energy debates for so long. Um, I could keep rambling on, but I think that basically sums up That's my great. First thank you so much, Alex. Um, UT, would you like to go next? Well, yeah, thank you very much. And um, thank you for having me. Um, my take on the energy question is really, um, well, as it comes out of this reality, would you believe that the entire of sub-Saharan Africa, where I come from, um, I come from Nigeria, by the way, um, the biggest economy in Africa, um, the richest country in sub-Saharan sub Africa. Um, but by far, the, is the bottom is like the bottom 20th in terms of energy access for people. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, would you believe that the entire sub-Saharan Africa uses up only, in a year, only 40 terawatts of energy? Now, that is equivalent to what the state of New York uses in one year. Mm -hmm. This is the continent that is the second largest. This is the continent that fits the entire of the US, the entire of Western Europe, the entire of China, Japan. Most countries in the world would, most other countries in the world, I mean, apart from South America, would fit onto the map of Africa. And yet, the entire of that region uses just about the same amount of energy as New York does. What I'm talking about here is energy access, just like um, um, Kadike has said. It's, and for me, energy access is really more the problem with governance. And, and so the debate has been so much about what technologies do we bring in, what ways do we inno innovate, um, what ways do we trade, how do we do this, and just like he's mentioned. I mean, and it's all wonderful, but that's going to be nothing, nothing at all for Africa, because no matter how much innovations you have, no matter how much ideas you have, no matter how much technology you have, if you don't have the right policies mm -hmm. to push those through, you're going to get nowhere. And for Africa, the problem has always been governance. And what do I mean by governance? It's about bad politics, bad policies, or not implementing good policies. How is it understandable that a country like Nigeria, my country Nigeria, would, as of today, not be able to provide energy, you know, regular energy for virtually everybody. The World Bank thinks um, maybe 40% of the country has access to energy. I'm, by this, I mean electricity. But that's, well, that's in figures. Because the reality on the ground is whether or not you have the lines running, you know, across, on the roads, across your villages, maybe you can actually see some poles with lights, um, with power lines on them. 
it's a different thing seeing the physical tra structure on the ground versus actually having energy in the rooms that you live in. It's a whole different thing having energy today and not seeing it for the next month. And when I say today, I mean one hour today. And that's the reality that most Nigerians face. Why would that be the case? Well, I'll tell you. Figure this. A country that is the sixth biggest producer of petroleum in the world has no functioning refinery. Maybe this doesn't come as a surprise to many of you. But think about it. What sense does it make that you pull out the crude from the ground, sell it to somebody else, and buy the refined products at higher prices? And even now that there is a big boom, you know, in terms of gas prices, and we go to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the stations now, and we we'll buy them for less than a dollar for a gallon. In Nigeria, the prices haven't changed. Nigeria produces the oil, but doesn't have any benefit in terms of what that oil is, is, is making. Okay, so we're selling the oil at cheaper prices, fine. But should we not be buying the gas at the stations cheaper? That's just an example of what, what we're talking about here. Now, let's get an example of countries where things seem to have worked in Africa. So Ghana, our next door neighbor, two countries away, at a point in history, celebrated 10 years of consistent power supply, at least in some parts of the country. That was Ghana. At that point, Nigeria had not seen even one week of consistent power supply in most parts of the country. We think it's really a matter of governance. And as long as we um, continue to debate the technologies, which is great, obviously for countries that have gotten it right, that's what we should be talking about. What should we replace for what? And it's not like Nigerians are oblivious of the realities on the ground, like we don't know climate change exists, or that we don't know there are ways we could actually get you know, ch things changed, or that we don't have the resources to actually make those things change. The IAA, the International um, Energy Agency, thinks that by 2014, Africa would be, Sub-Saharan sub Africa would be um, in a swell of energy availability, if all goes well. Well, they didn't have that in the reports, but I'm adding that to the report, if all goes well. And by that, I mean, if politics and the politicians allow those things that need to be done to be done, policies, implementations, those are the things that we actually need. And for us, until we get through that, most of this will go nowhere. Well, I said most because much as I like the top-down approach, there are many people in my country that favor the bottom-up approach, which is good, fine. Innovate, you know, and hope that someone funds your innovation. I know of a young physician myself, one of my physicians I trained back in the country, who has developed a prototype for a generator, I mean an electricity generator, that is supposed to be self-sustaining, powered initially by a battery, and then starts the energy, sends some of that back, recharges the battery, and continues to run. And that's just one person on his own. Not to talk about the kids in a secondary school that thought of a way to generate electricity using urine. So you pee into a bucket, catch some of that, start up the energy with a with, 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 with generator, catch some of that hydrogen, and you know, use that, bond that up as your fall from urine. What could be more sustainable? What could be more renewable than using urine you know, to create energy? And these were Nigerian kids yeah. in a high school. A Nigerian kid in the college, I think this is Harvard here, got the idea of using soccer, the soccer, the game we play. You call it, you call it soccer. We call it football. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So using soccer as a means to generate energy, mm -hmm. you kick a ball around, move some wires within the ball, and charge your phones off the ball at the end of the day. And we can go on the list of innovative approaches are endless. But those innovations go nowhere in a country like mine. As long as policies do not support research, we don't get nowhere. The other thing I would like to say just before I hand over would be this other approach. So it's it, it, it been, f for most of the world, it's been about mitigating you know, 
climate change, doing things to, you know, not don't let this get out of hand, kind of, you know, let's stop burning for, let's, you know, use more of this. Well, that's one way to handle it. The other way is to adapt. Okay, fine. So we have all this carbon in the air. What do we do to keep ourselves safe? How do we take care of health? How do we kill mosquitoes, you know, and adapt to climate change? The other way we could do that is geoengineering. Geoengineering, when I first heard the term, sounded like, you know, Nigerian oil is always in our mind. So that sounded like geo oil, you know, engineering. Well, I was wrong. I was completely wrong because geoengineering is, is all about changing the climate, doing stuff to directly impact the climate. You know, for example, throwing off sulfate particles to shield off um, atmospheric radiation, like solar radiation, and then that way you cool the planet. You know, that's just one of those ways. And as you mentioned, um, carbon, carbon capture, which is one of those ways you use. So geoengineering is either of those. And that's something that is big right now, I believe, on, 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 on the screen of you know, energy, um, energy discussions and um, climate change. But, but those are things that Nigerians are working on, you know, but we know at the bottom of our hearts that no matter how much energy we put at creating the, solving this problem, right, at creating solutions to solve the problem, if we don't have the support of policies and governments, governments then we would get nowhere. So that would be my take on this, and um, I hope we talk more about that. Right. Thanks so much, UT. Lisa, would you like to make your yes. comments? Yes, I'll just speak very briefly. I think one of the things that we've done is we've really uh, bifurcated the issues of um, dealing with poverty or figuring out sort of a new world vision and a kind of um, reparative vision towards energy and climate change. So what we've come up with is we have special poverty initiatives and then we have green initiatives. And these green initiatives are uh, oftentimes very limited in focus. They're, they're really focused on substituting a Prius for your regular car and then you substitute another car for your Prius. Um, and they, uh, the idea of green has become very associated with luxury items, not just um, in, in the headspace, but the, the subsidies themselves in the U.S. are particularly going towards the wealthy. Uh, most of the electric car subsidies that we've given away nationally and in California, there's like this uh, stunning um, electric car uh, program and almost all of that has gone to the top, you know, three to five percent of income earners. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is can you get more traction out of that money by combining um, po dealing with poverty and dealing with carbon at the same time, and I would argue that you can, um, at both on the sort of macro level of, of the world. Uh, it's, um, I, I think it's, it's somewhat offensive uh, when a new power line, uh, a new power plant in China goes online and U.S. Uh, newspapers sort of bemoan that there's another coal plant going online in China. We should actually be cheering that. That's all of us going ahead. Um, and, and we will have to fix this up, obviously, but my well-being does not depend upon someone else's poor being. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the problems is that we need to combine these things into a sort of a combined vision. Um, I also think that another uh, sort of um, message of the sort of green speak that we've engaged in here is um, that this can be easy, it can be substitutions, and it can be leave everybody um, pretty much in the same place where they started. And I actually think that um, we need to recognize that it's going to be another revolution. But when you think about it, uh, I'm about to turn 50, and I don't know how many revolutions I've gone through in my life already. I mean, we are children of the revolution, and this is, we, we have, our, my great-grandparents married themselves to that project a long time ago. And this is pretty much kind of the way that we have to go. The question is, do we have a vision to go with all these revolutions? Because if you don't, by default, they go over to something kind of ugly. Um, because as, as Mackenzie has mentioned, everybody has a stake. Everyone's playing. And you actually kind of have to, to see the field for what it is. Um, I also think that in this, if you, if you look at forward at, OK, we're in the midst of a revolution. There will be more to come. You need to start to think about things that are going to balance out um, and that are on net balance are going to get, sort of be pontoons if you're in this little boat on the sea that Brad talked about. And one of those is states. 
And in separating climate and poverty, we have dealt with states very differently. States we, we think we need for, for energy, um, but in terms of lending and, and the World Bank, we have dealt with a, a different agenda towards, towards states. So on the one hand, we've been de-strengthening states, and on the other hand, we've been saying we want to make treaties with states. We actually need to start investing in states, and we need to see functioning energy systems as essentially a proxy of how well a state works. Um, you know, the U.S. has this wildly, wonderfully functioning electrical grid, basically because FDR made some decisions back in the 20s that he was going to guarantee electricity to everybody. He wanted everybody to have a waffle iron. And we don't really have a vision of the world with a waffle iron, but we should. Because once you make a commitment to not just a light bulb, but also a waffle iron, you make a commitment to the waffle industry, and then you make a commitment to refrigeration and refrigerated food. And then you can start, you know, it's not just vaccines. It's a lot of things that start to take off. So there needs to be this sort of larger, inclusive, futuristic vision, rather than just sort of siloing green off to the side. Thanks, Lisa. I think um, the three of you have had made, made incredible, um, very salient points, uh, everything from the need to have space for innovation and collaboration between North-South and South-South to the governance issues um, regarding uh, you know, sustaining those innovations or creating space for them within some of those countries. And of course, whether or not we have the vision um, to move forward and, um, and find the answers that we need to address this challenge. I want to go back to a little bit of what you mentioned, Lisa, about um, having that vision. Um, and in my own work on, on energy access innovation and diffusion of, of off-grid solar technologies in India, um, what I'm finding is that you know, the things that are driving solar diffusion are not solar itself, uh, but it is the innovation in low-watt technologies that's actually going to drive the need for that energy source. So PVTV or 14-watt uh, you know, flat-screen LED televisions um, that are going to get people out there buying the 220-watt solar panel to be able to power that in addition to the lighting and the mobile phone charging. And just within the next two years, I think India is going to add about 40 million uh, smartphone users. Again, um, adding another, um, you know, um, big push to the need for uh, whether they be off-grid or on-grid um, energy resources. And I think that's where we are having some of those debates um, in, in the energy access space, is, is what are, um, if we need a vision, does it entail um, a more centralized approach, as we have seen in the past, or a decentralized approach? Um, or does it need both? Um, and perhaps some of you would like to, to speak about your experiences um, on, around that. Um, I'll, I'll just add very briefly that I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just said and, and some things that UT and Lisa have said. Um, I, I would like to particularly dwell on Lisa's remarks about the need to actually have conversations about states and UT's remarks about the need to talk about governance. Um, believe it or not, I've had conversations with folks who disagree with what you just said, Karthike, that it is, about the, it is solely about these technologies um, that, you know, that have become so cheap or so magically effective that they are going to change the world uh, and that now that we have these technologies, we don't have to worry about poverty and climate and we don't have to, we don't have to worry about the trade-offs that come with modernization and industrialization. We don't have to think about off-grid versus on-grid. The technologies will take care of it from now. Uh, and I would just like to vigorously push back against that notion um, that the, it, is a, it is a different world electrifying today than it was when FDR was around. We do have things like the socket. We do have things like 220 watt solar panels. Um, and in, in my view, that actually makes the case for good governance and states even stronger. We, we're starting to see the grassroots meet the top down. And we're starting to have to ask questions about how do we build modern industrial systems in these poor and middle income countries while dealing with so many different types of technology and so many different types of innovation. And I, I would just like to emphasize that it, it is not the technologies themselves that are leading the charge. It is these, these uh, socio-technical systems, these systems of innovation, um, and that, that absolutely requires uh, good governance. And I actually think that not only is that ignored sometimes, but I think that's actually refuted sometimes by, by, by people in these debates who, who use the, the climate bludgeon or who use the technology bludgeon to say, look, my worldview is right. Look, the technology is going to lead the way. Look, 
poor countries have to not emit and, and develop and grow the way that I say. Um, and I, I think that's unhelpful and unproductive. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear uh, your perspective, UT, and, and what Lisa was saying about states. I absolutely agree. I think it's interesting how um, different countries are innovating in different ways. Um, some of it, what you've done in India, where you're looking at the grids. Um, one thing that strikes me is that the grid of the future may look a lot different than the grid of the present. You know, once you can integrate gr batteries on your home level into that grid, you have both autonomy and connectivity with the grid. And that's happening organically um, in, I don't know if it's happening in Nigeria, I know it's happening in some cities in India where people have purchased inverters and they have batteries in their houses so that when the, powder, the power is on intermittently, they can store it and then use it when they need to. But that's also, all of that is, as we look to more people living in cities, we're going to have these essentially, our grids will become less a simple machine and more this complex adaptive system that's very hard to model, but is growing organically already. Um, and so in answering the question, uh, is this supposed to be um, a decentralized one or a centralized approach to take? I guess it's supposed to be um, both. And the example I, I have is with Nigeria, where um, the idea has taken off that we have independent power plants. And so these independent power plants are basically coal-fired plants, um, which are usually, no, not coal anyway, um, gas, yeah, so gas, so natural gas fired plants, um, which are available in virtually every state of the country. Now, so these plants have the capacity to produce so and so amounts of electricity. But because of governance and policy, we have an issue of the energy is available, but it's not being used up by anybody. An example being the one in my state, where the, the, the power plant was ready and set to go maybe some five years ago. And they were like, oh, let's connect to the transmission lines, and the government says no. And, and they couldn't understand it. I mean, we built this power plant because we thought we were going to use the transmission lines, and like, we didn't have that agreement. And I'm asking myself, who thought about all this? How do you ask people to go innovate and you know, do stuff, and then when it's time to connect, you say, no, if you don't pay such and such monies, we don't allow you on the grid, and if you do pay, the amount you have to get back in terms of your investment goes higher. And so the average Nigerian pays, I think, 20 times higher for electricity than the American and gets maybe a 1,000 times less the value. And so it, it still boils down to me, you know, yeah. policy-wise. What are our policymakers, you know, saying about their, their approach to, to, the, to, to, to electrification? And so beyond just, you know, using, we don't want to use gas, you know, or, or, or um, petroleum or wh whatever fossil fuels, we have the capacity for wonderful technologies. An example being the boy, I think you mentioned the boy, um, and, uh, using ocean, uh, ocean waves to generate electricity. That is something that we could easily do because most of South Nigeria lies on the Atlantic and Atlantic coast, and we could easily, you know, use such technologies if we had the right policies to push them forward. So, so it, for me, it's still a question of governance, and it will always be a question of governance, because until we get over that, no matter how much innovation we have, no matter how many things we bring in, you know, to the board, the effect will be limited. Right. We will change. We do have inverters. You know, I'm, I mean, Nigerians are smart folks, not because I'm Nigerian, but because, I mean, it's a way to survive in the environment we find ourselves, is to smarten up, you know. And so people thought about, about it, like, why don't I get a battery that can be charged by the regular, you know, electricity when it comes in, we have that, and then at least at night, we have some light to see, you know. And so inverters work quite well in Nigeria. Solar panels, people are building them, and or rather putting them on their roofs. People are talking about um, solar boxes they can actually install in their houses. So everybody is trying something, yeah. you know, but it's yeah, costly. That's the point. It's yeah. costly. It's unnecessarily costly that we have to fight so hard to get energy for ourselves. Nigerians are basically a county. Every family is a county on its own. You know, you generate your power. You provide your own security. Sometimes you build your own roads. It doesn't have to be like that. Right. 
Yeah, it underscores, I think, the importance of having the right kinds of the clarity from government as far as how to deal with those technologies and creating that space. Now, we have a little bit of time left for um, questions from the audience to engage the panel. Um, and so I'm going to open it up. And I believe we have a gentleman right there. Uh, Henry Hedker, researcher at NARA. Uh, back in 2008, I came up with the theory, the centrifugal force theory of the rise of the equatorial seas. And now, six years later, it, it appears to be coming true. This is due to the global warming and the melting of Arctic and Antarctic and a slight rise in sea level as a result, little by little, as this occurs. And uh, we now see, for instance, in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, a rise there of the water. The, the beach is slowly receding. It is much smaller than it once was. It has almost no width. Uh, is a very gradual descent, but well, the ocean has creeped in through the bay. And China has decided to take some initiative. Uh, they're big believers in climate change, and something has to be done about it. And what they're doing about it is, is putting in 15-foot seawalls around islands in the bay. And then planned is a 15-foot seawall, which will ring the entire bay and uh, transform Lagos itself uh, with plans to place high-rise buildings behind all this mm -hmm. and greatly change the entire outlook of the city. Uh, there's a great deal of people, uh, there once was 20,000 people living on what they call like sticks, something like Southeast Asia over the water and using their boats to go out and fish and, and do things. Uh, a certain way of life, but all that is going to be eliminated. Uh, there ne there's now 200,000 people living that way, so they'll have to move behind the seawalls. Either that, there'll be some other plan, but somehow they decide to eliminate it. Do you, do you have, I'm sorry, sir, well, that, a question? That's the question. I wonder, this being the case for this particular locale, what is the plans worldwide um, as far as trying to uh, stage a comeback against uh, the oncoming seas along the equator, affecting many, many nations and smaller islands, of course. Uh, does anybody rising, on I think that's do you have rising some? Yes. Uh, anybody want to speak on adaptation to rising ocean levels? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I guess the solution to that, I mean, it's not a solution, it's just a, a stopgap measure, would be to adapt. So, so at the point when Lagos was getting just getting flooded all the time, you know, and then there was a reality, I mean, it was real to us that the water levels were rising, the, the Bar Beach, which was the popular, you know, resort location for, for Lagos, was no more. At the point, there was no more Bar Beach because the water levels had risen so much that it had creeped in and was almost getting into the marina, the main road that faces, that goes off the island and faces um, the Atlantic Ocean. And um, they thought of maybe dredging some of that. Maybe that would help some of the, the, off, um, the offshore locations could help to dredge, to pull off some of the some of the seals and see if that could lower the water level. Um, they tried that. They put on some stones to block off the water. But all that was not so effective because it wasn't just a local problem. I mean, sea levels are not a local problem. Sea levels are a global problem. And therefore, the Nigerian government took on the initiative to actually, you know, set Put, put some support to the climate change um, initiative, the global climate change initiative. And we actually do have <coughs> lots of paperwork on that, lots of paperwork on things we would like to do. But when it comes to funding, what we see is that funding for tangible things that could actually bring change don't really come because someone tells you the money is not here. Reason because they get the money and they split it among themselves. Well, I mean, and this is not, this is not just saying. Fact is this, Nigerian legislators are the highest paid in the world. Highest paid in the world, and when we compare them, we're talking about people that are paid 10 times more than the U.S. legislator. So if a U.S. senator earns like um, 170000 whatever dollars, the Nigerian is, earns 10 times that. In a country that is 30 times poorer, but the legislators earn 10 times more than the U.S. They earn more than the U.S. president. In terms of earnings, in terms of salaries and allowances. So the idea is really, it's a government of sharing the money, as we call it. And so most of the monies we get from whatever we, resources we have go to the politicians. Least of it goes to funding anything like research or real stuff that can actually make change. Yeah, yeah. and of course making things more complicated for adaptation and climate. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to just take a couple of questions and then we'll do the answering. We can only take a few. So yes, right here and then a couple of back there. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Um, I went to a screening of the Masters of Doubt last night. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it was both disappointing and enlightening 
in that clearly the science is there. I mean, that's overwhelming. Yet you have leaders of major Western countries, Canada, Australia, one major political party in the United States, and others who continue to deny it or block any action. As you've raised, this is a global challenge, not just one for the US or Europe or Asia. What is it going to take if it was 88 when this first, the alarm was first sounded. It's now 2014. It doesn't look like we have another 25 years to waste. Mm -hmm. And my second point would be Pope Francis is expected to announce a major statement on climate change. It's expected that he will reinforce the scientific evidence. Might that be the tipping point that spurs those hesitant leaders or those who feel they don't have the political cover to address the facts and make some bold movements then. Excellent, thank, thank you. you. And just, we have a couple of hands there, but I don't know that we can take all of them. Just please be really crisp with your questions. I'll be crisp. I agree with the point that the poverty dialogue and narrative has been bifurcated from the carbon and climate part. What would you suggest can bring those dialogues or those narratives together for action together? Excellent, thank you. Um, I have a excuse me. <coughs> I had a question about the off-grid, on-grid issue. Um, it's not just here in the United States where we see, you know, when it comes to electricity, off-grid seems to be uh, a trend. Um, but in the emerging and frontier world, we're seeing a movement towards that as a way to bypass this policy uh, corruption issue mm -hmm. to get it to the rules. But at the same time, globally, there is a trend towards urbanization. Right. That's the reality. Yeah. So how do you reconcile off-grid versus on-grid with this trend towards ur urbanization. Excellent, and the final one. Um, I totally agree with the fact that poorer nations uh, could receive, should receive help from richer nations or emerging nations or whatever you want to call these um, poorer nations and that we uh, in the West or w whatever, there are because there are richer nations in Asia and also, but I'm totally on board with the fact that with the idea that richer nations should help poorer nations. But I have an ethical question. Is selling them technologies that we know are dangerous, like nuclear, um, is that a way of helping them? Okay. Or is that a way of making money for us? Excellent, thank you. All right, wow, a range of issues, and we have like maybe two minutes. Um, everything from, I think, thank you for pointing out the Pope, uh, because I remember I wanted to touch on some cultural movements around energy, including, I think, the Catholic bishops calling for an end to the fossil fuel era. Um, so, you know, that is, you know, these cultural movements impacting our energy debate, um, envisioning um, key issues around, you know, ethics of selling nuclear to, um, states in the global south and whether or not they may have the capacity to deal with them perhaps is another way of looking at it and how do we reconcile both an urbanizing planet with uh, on grid off grid and um, you know climate change and the energy access debate all right go <laughs> I don't think I can cover all of that but I'll just try and make one final observation in less than 30 seconds on rich poor ethics and adaptation I think uh, again for the past 20 25 years the climate energy debate has been bifurcated, as the gentleman said, uh, in another way along, mitigation versus adaptation. We can either deploy clean energy technologies or adapt to changing environmental constructs of the world. At best, we can do both together. Uh, what I would just close on is that uh, mitigation can be adaptation. Clean energy can be the best form of adaptation possible. We are less worried in the United States about uh, about damaging environments on our agriculture and on our cities than they are in Lagos, right? Be and a, a big reason for that is because of the abundant energy that we have. So when we think about adapting to climate change, it should not be a separate issue of providing clean, abundant energy. Those are the parts of the same conversation. Excellent. Briefly, you guys. So I think that beyond adaptation and mitigation, there should be geoengineering. And f the reason for this is because it would definitely they will go a long way to adding to the pressure, I mean, to remove, reducing the pressure, rather, of, on the climate. Now, the problem with geoengineering, anyway, is, again, governance, because it would need global governance. So it wouldn't be a Nigerian issue, and I wouldn't have to cry about that. Now, everybody would have to worry about that one, because then we'd need to worry about who is doing what, where, and how, you know, because whatever you do to the climate would have a global impact. And so geoengineering would, have to need, would need global governance. And um, beyond that, for Nigeria and for Africa, what we need to do 
they should support whatever initiative it is to get the right governments in place and the right policies in place. Civil society is struggling very hard, but not getting all the support they need. And if we could do our little part to aid that and move us in the right direction, we would go a long way. Excellent, Lisa. Yeah, and I think uh, it, at the same time, electricity does a lot. Uh, a consistent source of electricity does a lot for allowing you to think about how your civil society shapes. Um, but uh, I, I also think that this question, uh, I think that when you solve for poverty and for climate issues at the same time, you end up with a whole host of different sorts of solutions that look quite different. And one of them, I'm just going to say, because we've been talking the big, the big grid, small grid thing is that we have a lot of people moving into cities. They're going to be moving into very dense housing. Most of it is in very hot parts of the world. If you want those people to be able to run a computer, which I would argue is part of being a global citizen these days, they need to have not only consistent power, but they have, need to have enough AC so that the computer doesn't Absolutely. overheat. So that means that you need to start building buildings and cities where the AC is essentially integrated into the design of the whole, the whole city and the whole building. It's not seen as a separate add-on thing that goes on the outside. And that means that the building itself needs to be off the grid and on the grid at the same time. You need to have essentially batteries of, of cold water in the building that can circulate. You need to have solar panels on the roof that run things. Um, I can go into detail about that. But the, basically, we're, we're going to have to integrate big grid, small grid, and green and poverty into, into sort of a more um, systematic kind of thinking. Excellent. And with that, because we have solved the energy issue, <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much to our panelists, and we'll be around so we can take more questions.